Welcome everyone to our first uh, tree week webinar through the Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Group. Um, every day this week we have different webinars and tree week related activities and excited to be kicking off this week uh, with a presentation from myself and Amanda Sears. And we're going to be talking with you about how to not kill a tree, um, as well as, you know, how you can easily kill one um, and how you should uh, avoid Avoid that. So for today's presentation, I'm going to ask that everyone mute themselves and take their video off uh, while Amanda's presenting. And then we, when we get to the Q&A portions, feel free to bring that back. So if you do not know Amanda Sears, you are in for a treat. She is the horticulture agent of Madison County. And not only is she really knowledgeable about trees, but all sorts of plants, um, how to grow things in your garden, how to grow the big tree in your landscape and everything in between, and has a, a lot of great programming as well as a monthly newsletter that you can get on to learn more. So Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks for joining today. Thank you, Ellen, and um, thanks everybody for joining. We've been talking about Tree Week, so happy Tree Week. Um, just wanted to go ahead and start the slide with a, an, an interesting uh, sample someone brought into the office one day. Somebody brought that stump in and said, so what's wrong with my tree? <laughs> so that was an interesting talk, um, and we tried to kind of talk through it. It is a white pine, and so we tried to think about what might have gone on. Obviously, that is not the best um, sample to bring in, and we could not help that tree at this point. You know, when I took this job, I thought it would mostly be vegetable gardening, a lot of diseases and plants, but over the last few years, more and more, it has become tree questions until the point where I'd say about 60% or maybe more of what I do are trees that are um, not doing well or, or, or just dying or just picking new trees for landscaping. So I think this is a really important topic for today. So I'm just gonna go through a few um, things that I've noticed over the years um, when I've talked to people and, and some research that I've done on how to maybe um, keep your trees healthy starting out. Because really once trees start to decline, there's not much you can do. Most of what you can do is prior to planting. Oops, oops, hard on. So when you're starting to go out and pick that tree before you even plant it, make sure that you are purchasing a good, healthy tree. Now, if you look at that picture, you may see those trees are nice and they look healthy and large, but they're sitting on concrete. And so to me, what that means is on a warm day, that concrete's gonna warm up and those root balls are gonna get very hot and dry, um, unless one is out there watering them constantly. I actually water, I was a waterer at a, at a store once and, and it's very difficult <laughs> to keep things watered adequately. Another thing to look for, which you can't really see in this photo, but if a tree has been on its side like that for very long, it'll actually start to kind of curve back up. And so um, that is another indicator that that tree has been laying there a long time. This comes up a lot when I talk to people and when I've seen uh, visits. Um, remove the burlap and cut the wire basket. I think a lot of times people have um, nurseries maybe come and plant trees for them or they plant them for themselves and they leave that burlap on because that has historically been what's done. Um, but from what I understand, the current burlap that they use has pieces of plastic in it often, oftentimes and it doesn't break down. And to me, um, even if you're just using regular burlap, uh, it may not break down at the same rate at which your roots are trying to grow. And so it's gonna end up inhibiting that growth and making it basically just a, a, the root ball and well, the roots will start to encircle the root ball. Um, the same goes with the um, wire cage that's often on there. And I know what, it's hard um, to think about if you have a root ball and you're gonna put it in the ground, it's hard to think that you're gonna unwrap that root ball that it might fall apart. So put, you, one thing you can do is put it in the ground and then remove as much as you can, or at least open it up. And with the cave, the wire basket, if those are growing in, they can also inhibit, but they can also kind of cut the roots. So um, again, this is prior to planting, but some things to think about. You also wanna make the planting hole big enough. And ideally you wanna make that hole two to three times the width of the root ball itself. 
Um, and here in Madison County, which Ella mentioned, I'm in Madison County, Kentucky, we have a lot of really clay soil. In fact, uh, there are several pottery places here. And so where we have a heavier clay, I would actually recommend probably making that hole at least three feet, if not wider. And by doing that, you're really just making an area that when you put that dirt back in the hole, it's making area where the roots can grow a little easier. Um, don't make the hole really any deeper than what the root ball is. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Now, this obviously isn't a tree, but um, use only the soil you remove from the hole when you backfill. And this is where I talk to a lot of people and I, I think some things start to go wrong. Going back to my own county, we have a lot of clay. And in our minds, it makes sense that we would put maybe compost back in that hole or something really fluffy for lack of a better term. But what happens is, and, and kind of imagine this with me, is you've got a hole dug that's clay around it and you've dug the hole and you put your tree in there and then you put this really fluffy good soil in there, compost, and the roots go wild and they grow out. And then they hit that clay and then they don't want to go anywhere so they start to circle. And so it's really important that you have a kind of consistent um, uh, matrix, I guess, for lack of a better term, on where those roots are going to grow. And I know that's counterintuitive, but that's why it's so important on the width of the hole. If we can get that the width as long as we can, it'll make a better area and easier area for the plants to um, roots to go out. And so again, you know, it, it, it's the heavier clay you have in your soil, the wider that planting hole should be. Don't put anything else different back in that hole. And also, and I read different things. I personally don't like to put fertilizer in the hole planting. I know some people do, but I've read enough research that I'm kind of, I don't really like that in general. So this kind of goes back to the pot earlier. You want to avoid compacting the sidewalls for the same reason. And I helped with a tree planting here in the county several years ago, and they were going to put out like 20 trees. And when I got to the site, not on the way there, I was thinking, well, that's going to be a lot of trees to plant. They had an auger like this. And I guess maybe I should have said something, but it was too late. But um, they went ahead and they augered every hole for that tree, those trees. And what that's doing potentially is that's compacting those sidewalls. Even if it's a good fluffy, again, soil, it's going to compact those sidewalls. And as those roots start to want to spread, they're going to want to kind of go like this. And I have talked to people that have come in and um, they've had trees that literally, you know, they planted, the tree grew, but a big wind came and it literally just popped them out of the ground because they had kind of root balled so hard. So root balling is a problem. This is probably the most common thing I see and it took me a long time to really notice it and, 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 and be able to diagnose a tree this way. But don't plant the tree too deep or too shallow. And when we're talking about too deeply, that also includes mulch. And so trees should not go straight into the ground, like the picture in the top with that arrow. They shouldn't go on the ground like a telephone pole. They should have a natural root flare. So if you look at a tree, it should have a flare that goes out like that. And I should have given you an example to compare. If a tree is planted too deeply, and I, I might let Ellen talk about this later, <laughs> Um, but from what I understand, where that area that where the root flare would be stays moist too long. And so what happens is it sets up an area where um, moisture causes some damage to the trunk there at the bottom and the tree will fail. And it won't fail immediately probably, but it will um, shorten the lifespan. And so you can kind of give tree too deep a few different ways. You can naturally just plant it too deeply, which is easy enough to do. Unfortunately, another way to do it, though, is if you are planting the tree and you rough up the bottom of the hole, remember we want the hole to be as deep as our tree's root ball. So if you rough up the bottom a lot and then put it down, the tree may settle. One other place that I've noticed that sometimes is a little misleading is we'll look at a root ball and it may be wrapped with um, burlap. Well, sometimes soil is kind of piled up on the top of that root ball. And so what you may want to do before planting is take a soil knife or just your fingers or, or a spade 
and kind of gently take soil off until you get to where the top of the root ball is because that's where you want to plant it. And so sometimes it's a little misleading um, as to where that is located. Now, um, I, I was doing a little research up before the talk just to make sure I was um, up to date on everything. And you, if the tree is newly planted and you notice that it's, it's, it doesn't have a root flare, then what you can do is you can fix it. You can go in and you can um, redig, but as the tree starts to establish, it's going to be too late. This is another place a lot of people get in trouble and you can see that's a pretty big root ball over there. Um, but the larger the tree takes, the larger the tree you plant, the longer it takes to acclimate. And what I see again and again is that people um, call me and a very common question is, you know, I, I have a, I planted a tree two years ago and now it's browning or has spot. And I tell them, you know, transplant shock is very common on trees and shrubs. Um, for three to five years after planting. And so well, some of that is to be expected. However, a larger the tree is, the more likely it is to have transplant shock. So sometimes maybe choosing that smaller tree, which probably is less expensive to begin with, is it will help acclimate faster and may actually catch up with a larger tree that you bought. Um, just some things to think about. Um, I, I know a lot of times people when they're doing landscaping want to have everything looking complete right then, but there is some advantages to um, purchasing smaller stock. And since I am cheap, <laughs> I, I, most of the things I've planted have been very small. Now I've had luck and I've not had luck, but in general, smaller has worked for me. Kind of going back to everybody kind of feels like you don't have to take that burlap off. Everybody also thinks you have to stake. And from what I understand, staking often isn't necessary unless it is in a windy spot. Now, I don't think staking necessarily hurts anything in the beginning. But what I see happening a lot is that people will stake and then not remove the stakes. And so what ends up happening, and you can see in that picture to the front, is that the wires that you have around the tree have started to girdle as the tree has grown. The other problem is a lot of times people will use wires instead of maybe a cloth material. And so um, again, a lot of times staking is not necessary. If you decide to stake, be sure to remove the stakes probably after the first year. But I think a lot of the locations, at least here, and you know, we're not in Kansas in the wind plane, but here, you know, we have wind, but I, th I think I remember reading that trees that are not staked and are in that slightly windy location actually have better root establishment. Now I can't swear to that, <clears throat> but I think I read that. Uh, so again, just, I think ultimately with plants anyway, I think a lot of times people overlove them and want them to succeed so much that sometimes it can be to the negative. And I think this might be an example of that. So choose a good location. Now, the tree to the right was probably, may, may have been planted before those lines went in, I don't know. But very likely what could have happened is that somebody planted a tree with very good intentions, not thinking about what the end size of that tree was gonna be. And so as it grew, it got too close to those lines and it had to be cut. Now, to me, that just looks ugly. It's still a tree and I'm glad it's, st it's still there and not cut down. But that cannot be perfectly healthy for that tree to have that much foliage taken off that side. And I'm guilty of this as well. Um, and I don't know why it is, but I, you know, I, I planted some red buds at home and I looked out one day and I thought, why did I plant those under our lines to our house? I, don't know why. And sometimes I guess it's just a good open location, but it's so easy when something's like a bare root, maybe small, to not consider, okay, this is going to be 10, 15, 25 feet tall. And so um, this also goes back, and I think Ellen's going to touch on this later too, where we see this a lot is I'll talk to people who uh, say, well, you know, my tree uh, isn't doing well. Um, and I'll say, well, how, how close is it to the house? Because we've talked. And, well, you know, it's, it's not close. And then they'll send me a picture and it'll be about four inches from the house. But 
So you have to consider, in general, as much a, a much as above ground to a certain extent is below ground. And so in this case picture, it's the above ground that's troublesome. But for things that are up against the house, you're considering not only the foliage, but also the roots. So just in general, when you're choosing plants and their location, think about how big they're going to be in the end. I've, re I've read several times that the biggest pest um, to trees and shrubs are humans. Uh, and then we, I guess we've already mentioned several reasons why. And you can actually see in this picture, and I hadn't really looked at it until just now that closely, that um, it pretty much goes straight into the ground anyway. You can see a little bit of flare on the bottom. But be careful with mowers and string trimmers. This is a very, very common problem. And the problem that comes from this is that by hurting the tree, you're hurting its vascular system. And so where that wound is, is going to be less efficient in how it's taking water and food up and down the tree. So the tree, trees don't heal like we would heal if we cut ourselves. They compartmentalize it. And so while it won't kill the tree, it may weaken it and it may hurt that side of the tree. And so if you get a string that goes all the way around, it will girdle the tree and kill it eventually. So what do you do if this happens? You know, people often or want to know, you know, a branch broke out, what do I do? And don't, again, what I've read, do not paint it, don't put wound healer, it, it let it heal on its own. And if you look closely at that picture, and I hadn't noticed it till just now, I think I see where borers, so a boring insect has already started to bore into that area. Because that is another thing that'll happen is it'll start to attract um, insects and diseases because a tree stressed is what's gonna to start to attract problems. A healthy tree can withstand a lot of issues. And this is another thing that comes up, you know, not every year, but the years when we do have a really icy winter, the following spring and summer, we start to see issues around driveways and roads where we start to see dead uh, or burn, might be a better, uh, both, I guess, burned and dead material showing up. and we don't always think about the salt content of the soils. And we, um, at the extension office, one test we can run for the soils is salinity. And there's been times where, um, not a lot over the years, because we can usually figure it out just from talking to the person about the location and because we've known what's got, been going on with the weather. But occasionally, you know, something will happen and we run the salinity test and we see that the soil has become too salty in that area for plant growth. And a lot of times, I think that can be remedied by um, water, natural rainfall and it, it'll flush it through. But um, just be aware, you know, sometimes we can't help but salt the area or the area will be salted for us. But just be aware that can lead to a new set of problems and issues to look for. Um, even if it's not your fault and you're not doing anything wrong, it's still something to look for. Don't damage your roots. Um, and there's a lot of ways you can damage them, I guess. Um, of course, um, compaction on that left side, that's a lot of weight around the tree. And compaction, um, in one way, to, we think of soil as being a very solid material, but it's actually full of little pore spaces. Um, and so if you compact those little spaces, it can never really be fixed. And so if you compact those spaces, the roots are gonna to start to be compacted and have issues. To the right, I think that's a little more obvious about um, what might be going on. Uh, number one, the roots are being cut and um, the tree also, now that I look at that picture too, is very close to the house. And another thing is, and I, they'll probably move that soil, I'm sure, but it's actually burying the tree too deeply. And so there's a lot going on in that photo that's not helping that tree. And in general, just don't talk trees um, other than just being ugly. I think people, again, and this goes back to what people always thought you should do, like the burlap and the staking. What people think is they come back and they cut those trees back pretty, pretty harshly, like in these photos. And you start to get a lot of flush growth, like the picture on the left. And they think that's good, I've helped the tree. But that, gro that growth is in reaction to the cut. And it's a weak growth. And if you, so what'll happen is that growth will be more likely to 
break or have problems in, in wind and in storms. And you know, I've seen trees in the top that, that live another 20 years, you know, but ideally you do not want to top a tree and it can drastically reduce the lifespan. Um, so um, just in general, topping is not good. And there's probably other reasons. Oh, I think another reason was maybe it would attract insects to those cuts that are, aren't healthy. And I think too, when I'm talking to people and they'll say, you know, I, I have, I have a, yeah, just an example, I have a red bud and I've loved it and it's been the best tree, but it's dead. Well, how long has it been there? Well, probably about 60 years. Well, the trees have lifespans. And so just like other plants, just like animals, they have lifespans. And so part of that is knowing and accepting that no matter, sometimes we can do everything possible to help our trees and plants in our landscapes. And still things are gonna die, um, either from old age or from the weather. And I was talking to Ellen before we started just about he, here, and I assume everybody on here is probably from Kentucky, but when we've had rain instances, so this past summer especially, it's been very heavy, um, like two inches at a time. And that's a lot, that's a lot of stress on a tree. And so we are starting to see some decline of older trees here in the county which is unfortunate but just that's just one last thing to think about so I just wanted to uh, thank you for listening today uh, my name again is Amanda Sears and I'm the horticulture agent here in Madison County Kentucky um, and my contact info is there you're more than welcome to um, call or email me um, if you want to email me pictures that's fine or if you want to call, reach out and contact your own local extension service they're always willing to help and that little picture to the right um, I actually saw it outside my doctor's office years ago, and I just I just thought it was the funniest um, kind of scary <laughs> stump. I thought it was, um, and so I always kind of include it here at the at, at the Halloween time. So um, that is all that I have. Um, Wonderful, thank you, Amanda. Does anyone have any questions for Amanda? You so you gave us a whirlwind tour of um, how people commonly kill their trees. When they call you with questions mm -hmm. that are my tree died, um, these are the most common things that you see. And after this, we're gonna talk about a few tips on how to have healthy trees. And we're gonna revisit a lot of the themes that Amanda brought up in terms of what are the common problems and how can you avoid those? Um, yeah, and a lot of um, a lot of what I've learned, I've learned just through, um, I guess, observation. And I've been at this job of, of 14 years. And so I think a lot of it has just been um, kind of seeing it on my own. And maybe, you know, because I wouldn't have known, like, for instance, the, the, the flares and things like that on the tree roots. And once I learned that, I could, it's almost, well, it's almost, my job's almost like being a detective. And so um, you have to figure out what's, what's in the environment and what are the, what are the, what sort of things might have happened because we don't always know and, and we don't always know what to ask the homeowner. So are there any questions for me? And I apologize, I, I sometimes talk kind of quickly. So if anything didn't make sense, please let me know and I'll repeat it. Wonderful. Yeah, and if you have any questions, oh, I see someone unmuted themselves. Did you have a question? Yeah. This is Dan B. Carter. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you say, did I hear it correctly that a newly planted tree over maybe the first year will sometimes will often develop black spots on the leaves as a as from the shock of transplanting? Is that um, yes, and, and it's it depends on a lot of factors, but it's very common, and, and correct me alone if I'm wrong, but very common to have. Um, what we call transplant shock, um, the first three to five years, depending on the species. And also, um, you know, like I said, the size of the tree. And spots might be one of the symptoms. Um, you might have a few leaves die all together. Um, uh, other things might pop up that just look strange. And so a lot of times I'll tell people, you know, don't, don't, don't worry. I mean, keep an eye on it, uh, but do make sure um, to give it time and take care of the tree. And, and Ellen's gonna talk about how to keep the trees healthy in a moment, but that's really the best thing you can do um, is water is needed um, an inch a week. And so don't over water, uh, but yes, uh, three to five years, I believe, depending on the size. 
What about a lot of, um, what about insects making webs and so forth in the, in the um, uh, ex extension of the branches? I have that with a Kusa dogwood in my yard. And, and I think a lot of times I think a, a Christmas Christ catalog. Oh joy, I ran into I think some, somebody's unmuted, I think, but um, back to the insects, a, a healthy tree can sustain a lot of um, insect damage to the leaves, especially later in the season, or actually I think at any point in the season. Now, if it, it happens every year, I think that it can weaken the tree over time. But um, a lot of times if you see the webbing starting, and it's at a point that you can reach um, easily, I would take a stick and just rip it down. Um, but no, I think uh, just referring to like web worms and things like that, um, I think somebody actually just asked a question about cicadas. Um, the thing about cicadas is they like to really attack young branches that are about the size, I think, of a pinky, I think, or an index finger. With a young tree, I would definitely stuff, or I would definitely be, um, I'd keep my eye on it next year with those smaller trees and just kind of baby them. Um, but cicadas are a little bit different um, animal, I guess you can say, than like a webworm. Um, and I think, um, I think John asked about putting a tree skirt out to keep out weeds. And that is a good point. You can buy, um, and I guess I didn't mention that when I talked about um, the uh, string trimmer mower damage, but mulching around the tree is a good way to keep us from having to mow up close uh, to the tree. I think the tree skirts, and I don't know if that's exactly what they're called, are a good thing because water can go through them. Uh, mulching is another idea. But again, I wouldn't want to put the mulch up onto the tree because the, to the tree, that's no different than um, burning it too deeply. And one thing that I kind of like to do when I'm, especially when I'm planting new trees is instead of, and, and people commonly use that fabric, especially um, if you're doing a lot of bare root seedlings, you might go to a tree planting event with lots and lots of those. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important to reduce that competition from other other vegetation at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing I really like to do if I'm planting trees is to instead use cardboard and mm -hmm. uh, use kind of a cardboard mat and then mulch over top of that because that will degrade over time. Um, it will exclude weeds for a while and then it will break down. Um, but you do want to be careful not to put too much mulch over the top of there. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen, I have a quick question about cardboard because I, I like the idea and I use newspaper in my garden, but with the cardboard, it does enough water seep through around the tree um, for it to be useful or how do you, I've always kind in of- In my experience, it breaks down really rapidly as long as it's not like the plastic kind of plasticky kind. Mm -hmm. um, it will pretty rapidly become very permeable. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. within a season or two, it'll- mm -hmm break apart entirely. Uh, so it does not last forever, but a nice short term when you're planting trees. Um, and I see that we had a question about rain stress and, and what are the kind of signs of, of too much rain. And one of the things that Amanda mentioned is that we've had a lot of rain lately. And, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, we had a major drought period. Um, so, so we had that extreme, but even within that year, it was wetter than average. Um, so even though we had this major drought, we still got more rain than average for the year. And that's something that's happening right now. We are entering what people call pluvial period, a period with more rain than there has been in the past. And what that means for your trees is that um, some trees are going to love it and do just fine. And other trees, that might be a stress for them. So you might have a tree that prefers maybe a site that's a little bit drier, um, that is going to struggle more with that. And what it's going to struggle with is having wet roots, or, you know, having wet feet, as you might say. Um, 
it might struggle with an increase in root rot. Um, so the tree would do fine on its own, but now you have more kind of soil pathogens and fungi that are attacking its roots. And some trees are better adapted to deal, deal with that and some trees are less well adapted. So one of the things that I, um, when that is the case um, and particularly interested in is drainage. And what is drainage? Look at that site. You can do what's called a perk test to kind of see um, um, you know, how rapidly does water drain from that soil? And I think I see the most problems in areas where the drainage is already bad, um, where maybe something's been rerouted. So, so the gutters are draining right into the tree and also it doesn't drain very well. And then you have increased rain and you might see all the symptoms that go along with root rot. Uh, so uh, in, in this, in my mind is frequently a, a slow decay over time. Um, you might notice it as like all of a sudden your tree died, but really that tree has been declining little by little. And things that I might look for for that would be kind of putting on less and less growth each year in those shoots, um, those leaves being stunted, being kind of maybe scorched a little bit on the outside edges, um, a little wilty, a uh, thinning crown. Uh, so the top part of the tree is just not as full and kind of vibrant as you'd expect, um, early fall color. Um, it's hard to know when it's a root problem, right? We can't see the roots and that makes it really tricky. Um, but those are some of the kind of, uh, kind of cues that I would use, the clues that I might use to determine, oh, there's some, some root issues going on there. Anything else you want to add on that, Amanda? Um, I, I think one common thing when, I, when I, people send me pictures of what's going on at their house, um, it, it's, again, going back into being a detective, you know, I'm zooming... First of all, and when you're working with extension change, send us the highest quality photo <laughs> that you can because I like to zoom in and look at everything. But one big problem is, and you mentioned it, gutters and where the water's coming out into the yard. And we don't always think about that, how much water might be going and dumping into that area. Um, but yeah, the, I always tell people, you know, it's not a tomato plant. We can't pull a tree up if, if it's a, an established tree and look at the roots to see what might be going on. And so we kind of have to, to guess but you know what's hard is once things start to decline what can you do I mean you can you can I guess the thing is the only thing you can really do I guess is take as many stresses away as possible you know mulch on them water them if it's if it's dry not if it's raining but if it's dry um mulch on um maybe fertilize them if it's needed and one other thing too is um that I encounter we have tend to have a high pH soils in our county and not real high, but plants can only grow within a, a kind of an optimal pH range. And if people are growing like white pines here in Madison County, they don't grow real long. Like the lifespan is like 12 years, 12 to 15. But I'm from Southern Kentucky and the pH is different and they grow better there. And like you can grow hemlocks in Southern Kentucky, but not here. And so one thing, you know, we, the extension offices around the state do soil testing. And one of the biggest things I look at when people are having problems is the pH of the soil. Um, again, there's sometimes not much you can do, but there are some um, certain fertilizers like hollytone or something for active living plants that can maybe be used that might reduce some stress as well. Great, so I think we're gonna pick back up with this presentation now um, with some tips for you in keeping your trees healthy. Um, so if you don't know me already, my name is Ellen Crocker and I'm a forest health extension specialist here at the University of Kentucky. And um, forest health is a lot of different things, but it includes trees and what's going on with trees, whether they are in your woods you know, or in your landscape. And there are many challenges for trees out there in the landscape setting. And Amanda talked about quite a few of those, um, but I always like this graphic. It is not mine, but I think it's fantastic for, you know, the many different ways that you can kill a tree. Uh, we just went through a lot of those, right? Um, but whether it is uh, compacting the soil or impacting the roots or poor pruning or wrapping something around it, you know, you name it, there's a lot of different challenges out there for landscape trees and 
for landscape trees, I would say that the biggest challenge are humans. I mean, <laughs> we are kind of the, the, the major issue for many landscape trees. Um, we cause a lot of these problems, uh, whether it's kind of poor matching of the tree to the site, poor planting, uh, poor maintenance, a damage, uh, creating an environment with low diversity of species, um, you know, lots of different things. And those stresses can add up over time. But the good thing about that is that if we are the cause of these problems, we can also be the kind of um, the, the things that solve them, right? So we can fix those problems and we can promote the health of our trees as well. And I wanted to put this little note in here as well, um, because you know a lot of what I do are insect and disease issues. And uh, insects and disease can certainly cause problems. Um, uh, and there are many of them, but I kind of want to emphasize most cause very minor damage. Uh, most of the, the uh, insects and pathogens in our landscapes are, are minor issues by themselves. Um, many, however, can kill stressed trees. So if you promote the health of your tree and you have a very healthy tree, it is less likely to be hurt by the many different insects and pathogens that are out there. Those trees, um, typically, trees are amazing and resilient, right? This is tree week and we are celebrating all things tree. Uh, and trees are astounding in their resilience. Uh, so if they are doing well, they can defend themselves from most things. Now, there are a few examples that can attack and kill perfectly healthy trees. And a lot of those are invasive species, things like the emerald ash borer that I've, I've shown here, a tiny little beetle uh, that is native to Asia. And when it was introduced to us, it rapidly kills our native ash trees. And, um, you know, there's not a lot uh, in many cases that we can do to stop those invasives once they're here. We can try to keep them out. And there are protective treatments for, say, emerald ash borer that you can use to protect individual trees. But there are many, many ways that you can promote healthy trees in other ways. And, um, you know, the emerald ash borer is terrible, but that is going to be a relative kind of an, an, an unusual circumstance. Most of the tree problems that I see are more the legacy of long term stress on those trees. So for the rest of our session today, I'm going to give you just five tips for healthy trees. And um, hopefully this alone will go a long way towards uh, you having the healthiest trees you can, um, hitting on many of the things that Amanda already mentioned. Um, so my first tip is to pick the right tree for your site. And I wanna emphasize a couple things with this. First, the right tree for the site, because sometimes a tree that looks beautiful in this, this location when it's young, um, it's easy to forget uh, that, that that's not how it's going to stay, right? It's going to grow huge. Uh, some trees can be massive, and that's wonderful, and we love that. We love these big, massive trees, um, but we need to plan for them and put them in appropriate places, whereas in uh, you know, other locations, a smaller tree might be more appropriate. Uh, so let's kind of give some examples of that. At the same time, you need to pick a tree that's right for you. So, you know, there's no one right perfect tree for anyone. Some people, this is a, a weeping willow. Some people love the look of weeping willows. Um, uh, they're fast growing. At the same time, they can be messy and they can fall apart rapidly. And Amanda mentioned trees that don't live too long. This is one of those trees. So it's not the perfect tree for everyone. Uh, this is a silver maple. Um, another one, this is gonna be a fast growing tree, but then it's gonna fall apart fast. It's not gonna be long lived. However, if you want something that's gonna grow really rapidly and establish, um, it certainly will. This is a tree that I planted in my backyard, a persimmon, one of our native fruit producing trees. Um, and I happen to like persimmon, but if I wanted a tree that produced no mess, this would be the wrong tree to plant because 
I mean, look at this fruit. It's messy. I don't know if you've, you have one in your neighborhood, but uh, you know, each year when it's producing those fruits, they drop everywhere and they can be a bit messy. So if that's not what you want, that's not the right tree for you. Uh, the same might be true for tulip poplar or yellow poplar. Um, I think it's a beautiful tree and I love it, uh, but it can be a bit messy with these large, beautiful flowers dropping. And then another thing about yellow poplar is that whenever it's stressed, it drops its leaves. So with these past um, kind of dry summer conditions, uh, the one in my backyard has dropped its leaves, oh, at least three times over the course of the summer. And that's its kind of natural stress response. Um, that particular tree is adapted to do that. And so good for it, but maybe not as good if you don't want a lot of leaves dropping in your yard, right? <laughs> so again, there's no kind of one perfect tree, but knowing what you want uh, will help you pick the right tree for you and your site. Uh, here's another one, a catalpa. I love it, but it could be a bit messy um, as well with the flowers and the seed pods. Um, another thing is to avoid certain species. That will set you up for success. Don't plant trees that are known to be invasive. Um, here's a picture of a calorie pear, a Bradford pear. In this example, it was a really popular cultivar of flowering pear um, because it grows rapidly, it has few issues, and it has these nice white flowers in the spring before anything else is producing flowers, it produces flowers. And it was wildly popular for a while. Um, and it was advertised as being sterile, so the seeds would not spread. Uh, but a couple of problems with Bradford pear. Um, first off, that whole sterile seed thing didn't really pan out. It turns out that Bradford pear is sterile Bradford pear, but not the many, many other uh, uh, calorie pears that are out there. And a abundantly produced seed, those invade old field sites, road sites everywhere. Uh, when you walk around and drive around this spring, you will see it blooming and think, oh my goodness, I had no idea. It's just rapidly invaded in our area, causing problems because we're not getting the diversity of trees you want, you're getting a sea of calorie pear. Um, so that's a problem. You know, it doesn't stay put in your yard. It causes issues elsewhere. But also in the case of calorie pear, it falls apart. Here's an issue of the, that it is known for, it will drop branches. It has these really poor branch unions, these kind of sharp branches come together in these sharp bees that if we have an ice storm, which we will, if we have unpredictable winter weather, which we're in Kentucky, so we definitely will, um, it will drop branches quite regularly. So not a long lived tree there are better choices for your landscape. Similarly, um, trees that are really known to be short-lived in this area, uh, this is a Colorado blue spruce. Um, those are a temporary tree in our landscape settings for the most uh, part in Kentucky. Um, they, they're really good at dying, and unless you're super lucky and have the perfect site for them, uh, they will die on you pretty pretty consistently. Um, so you're better served getting something else. You won't be trying to push a rope uphill with keeping this tree alive um, if you pick another species, uh, not this one. And then, you know, other trees just have known issues. So this is a, a flowering cherry, um, known short-lived tree, known issues. You might say, that's okay. I love that tree so much that I still want to plant it, um, even though my flowering cherry tree is going to uh, be short-lived and fall apart and have um, you know, known insect and disease issues because I love its flowers. Um, at the same time, knowing that I think helps you prepare for the added work that's going to go into maintaining that. So, you know, uh, we already heard about some of the common kind of mismatch issues with picking a right tree for the site, whether it's putting a tree right under the power lines, it's going to grow large. Um, when you could have put it, look at this picture right here, they could have put this tree in their yard, in the middle of their yard, and they would have avoided that whole problem, right? Um, so thinking about where to locate, not just kind of the species of tree, the type of tree you're using, but where to put it so that you won't run into those issues. Um, this is another common tree issue where this large tree was planted, sidewalk put in right here, and you can see it's popping up 
that sidewalk, uh, causing a tripping hazard there. Um, so, and real accessibility issues. And there are things that you can do to adapt that sidewalk afterwards, um, you know, redoing the sidewalk so that the tree can still live and you can have that sidewalk there and that accessibility. Um, at the same time, you can also choose to put your tree instead of right in this little strip between the sidewalk and the road, you could put it in the front yard instead. Um, or use a smaller tree, like it, here's a, a nice amelanchy or a service berry, a smaller tree or putting that tree in the yard instead of right there in that challenging spot for it. Another thing that I frequently see are people who plant trees right up next to their house. And that might have been great when those trees were small, uh, but then those trees grow and they can provide, uh, create serious issues, structural issues for those houses, um, you know, into the foundation. What happens when those trees do die and need to be removed? That's a real challenge, a very expensive proposition as well. Um, so for if you want to plant something right near your house, selecting something that's going to be more appropriate, less likely to have invasive roots, less likely to create a problem down the road. And if you're interested in planting trees, I mean, it's tree week, right? This is a perfect time for it. There's lots of tree giveaways. Um, if you're trying to figure out the perfect tree for your site, I really encourage you to check out the UK um, horticulture webpage. And I can put a link to that in the chat, as well as the Kentucky Division of Forestry's um, uh, seedling order form. So uh, UK's Department of Horticulture has this great website where you can find all sorts of different native trees and information about them. And then the Kentucky Division of Forestry sells small bare root seedlings very inexpensively. Um, and these are great choices if you're doing a larger tree planting. A lot of great native trees to choose from, and you can find that online as well. So tip number two is to plant those trees carefully and correctly. Um, as Amanda mentioned, a lot of the problems that we see with trees actually started many, many years ago. They plant, started decades ago when that tree was first planted. So by planting uh, carefully and correctly, you can save yourself some headache down the road when it's much harder to fix those things. So a few tips from me on that. Um, first, avoid planting during the summer. Um, just it's a hard time for trees. If you imagine a lot of the trees you're transplanting, the root system has been compromised in some way. And that's very important for the tree's ability to take up water. Um, and summer can be a challenging time from that water perspective. Uh, it's hot, so those trees are going to be losing a lot of water, and we don't get as much water. So um, if you can plant during the dormant season, that's ideal. Um, fall is a great time for planting. Uh, spring can be a good time for planting. Uh, but for both of those, you do want to water the following here. Um, when you're planting trees in the landscape, make sure that you locate and avoid any underground utilities before digging. And you can do that by calling 811. Um, that's a great uh, kind of uh, resource there. Oh, appears like it's gone a little less. Um, identify when you're planting a tree, identify the root flare of the tree. And um, when I'm looking at this tree right here, the root flare is the part where it, here's the kind of trunk where it kind of starts to flare out right there. And that's the transition zone between the trunk, which stays above ground, and the roots, which stay below ground. And the reason I, I think identifying that before you plant it, you know, when it's still in its container or however you've purchased that tree is important because that's where you want the soil line to roughly be, is right where it's flaring out. You don't want it to be higher up than that because if you do, parts of that trunk will be underground and trunks don't deal well with that. Um, not only will the um, kind of having soil up against it could increase the risk of rot and other disease issues, but having those roots too far down, um, roots need to breathe so they could suffocate. So first identify the flare of the tree, dig a wide um, hole, Depth is important so that that root flare is right in the right place, but much wider, I think, than most people think. Two to three times the size of the root ball. And if you've got a bare root tree, you want to let those roots kind of expand out. You don't want to just kind of 
shove all those roots into the smallest possible hole you can. And you want to kind of let them have enough space that they, they can kind of grow into. Um, and unpack your tree. Remove any of this packaging material that came along with it. Take it all off. Um, uh, the wire, the burlap, the, the ropes, everything you can uh, to, and really kind of let that root fall, let those roots expand as much as you can. Encourage them, pull them out, um, cut them if there's any girdling or pruning necessary of those roots before you get them in the ground. And this is just a picture of, for anybody who's buying one of those larger trees, what they might look for, cut all of that off. And you can't always get the bottom of this, this wire basket off, but uh, most of the trees occur in the top portion of the soil. They don't tend to go down that deep. Uh, so making sure that those roots have access to a lot of growing space. Um, going forward. And here's a picture of a, a tree that I planted, a recently planted tree. Um, you can see the size of that uh, planting hole compared to the size of the tree, much larger, right? So I think that's a, another, another tip. Um, so tip number three, take care of your trees. And I think that's, that's going to be a challenge because, you know, what do trees need? Uh, there's some common misconceptions there that I'm going to briefly address. But stressed trees equal avoidable problems. So let's try to, to stop that and keep those trees as healthy as possible. So question number one, mulching. Uh, Amanda mentioned this earlier, but these, this is a common sight that I see with mulch that's been piled all the way up around the tree. And I think the intention there is good. Um, you know, Mulch is going to be added every few months, whether a tree needs it or not. And look how much mulch. If a little bit of mulch is good, a lot of mulch must be better, right? No, actually, that's that's not it. I, I appreciate the sentiment. But what that's doing is it's piling that soil up against the trunk. So there's going to be rot there. Um, but then it's also suffocating those roots. So they might be going around and around in circles. And here's a picture of a tree that's got those girdling roots. What happens down the road? It can kind of strangle that tree. And you don't want that. So instead, of mulching like that. Um, just mulch when it's needed and, and not very much, just a few inches, two to four inches um, of mulch and kind of pull it out away from the base of the tree. So you can see this is kind of, uh, uh, this ring is a little bit extended instead of it going up into a volcano, it's pulled out like that. Um, so mulch out to the drip line of the tree if possible. That's kind of, if you look up at the canopy, where does it extend? Where would kind of water drip down from those leaves? That's the drip line. So really the mulch, the more mulch, the better for trees. Now that might not work with what you want in your yard, but uh, that's what your tree would prefer, right? Um, don't have mulch right up against the trunk of the tree. And really you only need a couple inches of mulch and then reapply that as necessary. Mulching does a lot of different things for trees. Uh, number one, it protects them from mower and string trimmer damage, um, but it also creates the, the good habitat there for the tree's roots. And you can uh, plant some other things in here, but what you don't want to do is kind of irrigate uh, underneath this tree the same way that you would lawn. Trees and lawn need very, very different things. Uh, so for many people, mulching is a way to kind of distinguish that space and what trees need versus what your turf needs. And there are many different types of mulch that we're not going to talk about right now, but if you have questions, we can certainly address those. I really prefer a coarse organic material because that helps build the soil. Um, so, so coarse uh, wood chips, um, watering. That's important, especially if we're in a drought period um, where trees are not getting enough rain. A kind of general rule of thumb, if you have a rain gauge at your house or something, is if it's rained an inch in the past week, your trees are probably fine. <laughs> you probably don't need to do any additional watering. But if it's not raining, you might, especially for those newly planted trees, want to supplement that. Um, and when I Google watering trees, these are the images that come up. Unfortunately, these are both terrible examples of watering trees. Not that the intention isn't great, but this is not what trees need. Trees do not need a little sprinkle from a watering can from time to time, like your flowers might. And they don't need, you know, a quick, short, you know, spray with a hose um, at full strength. What trees really need is a slow trickle of water um, over an extended time period, and then to kind of 
let that dry a little bit, let that percolate and um, be absorbed by the tree. Uh, so, so not to be constantly wet, uh, that's a recipe for decay and rot, um, but to be thoroughly watered, uh, rarely. So this is kind of a picture of uh, what I do at home because I'm not very fancy. I have a hose that I just turn on a trickle and then over the course of several hours, we'll move it around to my, my tree. You can also get soaker hoses or tree watering bags that can all kind of do the same thing. So, so other things, Amanda mentioned pruning and the importance of not topping trees. Um, I've also got some examples here. This is a, a huge pruning cut. You know, it's flush with the side of that tree. And the problem with that is that there's lots of exposed wood. Um, and so a decay fungus is going to see this, and it's a banquet because it can move right in there and cause lots of decay. So you really want to have um, the, make the smallest cuts that you can um, and only when there's a, a necessary kind of reason uh, for that. Um, so um, being careful with your pruning, not topping, not doing anything that's known to, to damage your trees. Uh, Amanda mentioned this earlier, but four, protect your trees from construction or other damage. And these are just a few photos of some construction damage to trees. Uh, you can see, you can imagine, this is, these are living organisms. Their roots are essential to them. And these trees are not, th this is not the recipe for success down the road. They might be fine this year, but every year they get a little bit worse and get a little bit worse. Um, so they're not gonna die all right away, but this is a recipe for decline down the road. Um, so so instead of doing that, if you're doing a construction, you can set up a kind of fence and a zone to protect those trees if you want to keep those trees. Um, and the same would go for mower, mower and string trimmer drainage. I mean, that's one of the reasons why mulch is so valuable is just to protect them from that. And then five, um, observe your trees and learn to distinguish minor problems from major issues. And I put these photos up here because two of these are pretty minor issues. This is anthracnose. It's a foliar fungal disease that pops up each spring. Um, for the most part, pretty minor damage. This is tar spot of maple. Um, it again, pretty minor. You're not gonna, you're gonna notice it. It's gonna be really visible this time of year, uh, but it doesn't actually hurt the trees. Uh, just kind of uh, an aesthetic thing. Um, but this is bacterial leaf scorch of oak, which can kill trees and will cause them to decline, get worse year after year. And being able to distinguish these, see when something's going wrong um, and address it immediately uh, is much easier than kind of down the road, as Amanda mentioned, bringing in a big dead tree trunk and find, trying to figure out what happened. Um, if you can watch your trees and observe them and notice when things aren't quite right, that's a lot easier than trying to play catch up down the road. Um, so uh, a kind of, you know, caveat, diagnosing tree problems is hard. It's hard for me, it's hard for Amanda, and we're professionals. Um, and, and that's because sight and history are key, and it can be hard to pinpoint any one factor. There are lots of different issues that can stress trees over time and make them susceptible to secondary issues, to other problems. Um, sometimes, even when the cause of a problem is clear, there can be few management options. So when it's you know way down the road uh, and your tree is dead and dying, um, the only thing that I, that many times I can say is let's promote the health of that tree. Uh, it's much much easier to avoid that problem to begin with, to kind of um, uh, not set your tree up for success so they don't have those problems in the long term. And there are lots of resources that are available to help. And I just want to emphasize how valuable I think it is to uh, reach out to um, tree professionals and others. So uh, Amanda mentioned the county extension offices. If you're not familiar with this, I can put a link to, the, to this in the chat. Um, if you haven't worked with your county extension office, I highly recommend reaching out to them. Um, they are wealth of knowledge. Um, there are lots of fact sheets also available on all of the topics that we just talked about, from planting trees, both bare root and container trees, to pruning them, to, you know, anything you can imagine with trees. Um, University of Kentucky has so many resources available to that. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and, and I think that this, this a lot of people aren't aware of, is that 
you can hire a professional to help you with your trees. Um, uh, paid tree professionals, arborists are incredibly knowledgeable for those landscape trees. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people might just go for the cheapest option when it comes to maintaining the health of their trees. But an arborist can help you identify what the problem is, um, actually, you know, help you manage that and promote the health of your tree. And um, you can find a list of arborists, certified arborists by the International Society of Arboriculture, which is the main professional group, um, through their website, find an arborist and just put in your zip code and you can find a list of arborists in your area. Um, and that's for those landscape trees. If you're dealing with more uh, a woodland setting, I really encourage you to reach out and work with a forester. I'm either a service forester from the Kentucky Division of Forestry or a consulting forester. And there are also lots of great newsletters out there that you can join and learn about what's happening in our area. There's Kentucky Pets News, as well as uh, Amanda's newsletter, Pay Dirt for Madison County and many others. Um, check with your, your county agent and others to see what might be the, the appropriate news sources for you. And there's lots of great things on social media. Um, you can follow uh, myself and my lab at KY Forest Health, um, as well as Amanda's group with uh, Madison County Horticulture. And with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions. And, and thanks to all of you for joining us today for Tree Week and celebrating all things tree. Uh, I hope that this is just the start of a lot of great events that you're going to be going to. So let's see. Um, I'm going to look back Ellen, through those. I think, I've, I think I've been caught up on all the chat. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, it, is it okay to plant plants like a small garden of perennials under the base of a tree? I um, do. I do. And I, um, if you could come to see my house, uh, you, I would not win any gardening awards, Amanda. I don't think I would, um, because I'm not sure how aesthetically pleasing it is to others. It's very aesthetically pleasing to me because I've planted kind of a, a prairie under uh, my trees. I have extreme full sun uh, where I'm at. And so I have some large trees in my front yard, but also a lot of sun. And so I have planted, mulched the entire thing and planted it with a lot of native plants. Um, and they don't require watering. Uh, they are um, amazing for bringing in insect diversity. Uh, so I have a lot of fun doing that. I have a lot of fun bird watching right now. The birds are loving the seed heads on my sunflowers and my asters. Um, but uh, those plants work very well with trees. And imagine like trees growing in the woods, right? There's going to be plants all around them. They're going to have tons of other plants um, growing in the understory. Uh, but they may not be the types of plants that people are used to growing uh, in their front yard, right? It's not going to be turf all the way up to the base of that tree necessarily. Um, there are some cases where you can do that. Um, it just is going to be a lot harder because a lot of times the things that trees want and the things that turf wants are not the same. Um, but you can plant those perennials underneath. I would uh, have the caveat that um, watering can be tricky because some of those perennials, if they need a lot of water and they want to be watered regularly, that could be a problem for your tree. Um, so, so just my thoughts on that. Amanda, did you have any others? Um, I think that's pretty much I have read that you shouldn't try to put like a raised bed, like where you're mm -hmm. taking soil in and trying to raise it because it goes back again to the, excuse me, making the tree to planted too deeply um Very but um, I think that'd be a great way to mulch around it um, yeah, great I can't point. Really think of anything else. And I've but, seen that. Um, and you go to Lowe's or any other home, you know, Home Depot, and you'll see these things to make like a raised bed around your tree. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, Those like rings. Yeah, yeah. And I always kind <laughs> of cringe a little bit because if you were to actually do that, it might look lovely, but your tree would not be very happy about you piling six inches of mulch right underneath it. Um, you know, that's that's not what that tree wants. Um, uh, some trees can tolerate that better than others. And some, you know, some trees can deal with that stress much better than others. Um, for others, that's a kind of recipe for, for tree death. It might take a while, um, but but uh, you, your tree would be much happier without that. 
Um, so I see we have a question. Is there a way that I can view this presentation some other time? Of course, this is recorded and I'll post it on um, our YouTube page. You can find that at KY Forest Health. And so I'll try to get that up um, before too long. Um, uh, can I highlight or briefly go over some of the financial incentives that people might use for tree health or gardening to help uh, get people motivated to take get better care of their landscaping? That's a great question, Maverick. Um, you know, there's a lot of great financial incentives out there to take care of trees in the woodland setting. Um, and if you've got woods, I really encourage you to reach out to both the Kentucky Division of Forestry and um, service forester, forester, reach out to your county agent and reach out to NRCS um, who occasionally have cost share funds to promote the health of your woods and do all sorts of different things from removing invasives to taking out hazardous material and much, much more. Um, and, uh, you know, great options there. Um, options in the landscape setting, that's going to depend on where you live and what's going on in your local area. Are there any programs that are available to you? Um, one thing that I really recommend is checking out these tree giveaways and mulch giveaways. So in the city uh, that I live in, we have a regular mulch, you know, giveaway from the city. Um, you can you can go and pick up a truckload of mulch um, several times throughout the year. There's opportunities to get free trees um, that are high quality trees because I think one place where people cut corners that they shouldn't is getting kind of whatever is available. You know, the cheapest tree that they can find at the big box store near their house, uh, whereas investing in a tree that's gonna be a better fit for you and your site, even if it's smaller, um, as Amanda mentioned, sometimes you might get a bigger tree and think, oh great, it's, it's, it's bigger, it's, it's gonna do better. Actually, no, because its root system is so much more compromised um, that it might take years. They say that for every inch in diameter, your tree is when you plant it. That's how many years it's going to take before it even starts to put on new growth um, because it's just recouping the losses of its root system. Um, if anybody knows of any fantastic programs to help people uh, with, you know, incentivize um, tree health and gardening, put those in the mm. chat. A lot of cities do have regulations um, surrounding both what species of tree you can plant um, as it kind of in the as street trees and uh, where you can plant them. So make sure you check on those. Um, let's see. We have a question about winter creeper, the vine that goes up many trees. Yes, I don't like winter creeper either. Uh, I'm not a fan, Danby. Um, it is an invasive species. Uh, the reason I don't like it is because it does not stay put. People plant it for erosion control. They'll plant it because it's evergreen and it looks pretty um, and it's just kind of a carpet, uh, but it doesn't stay put and it will move into you uh, everywhere. If you have it in your backyard, you know, it moves everywhere. <laughs> um, you can't get rid of it, uh, but it'll also move into wood wooded areas um, and carpet the ground and prevent the diversity of species you want to be seeing. Some interesting things about winter creeper is that it only produces flowers and seeds when it is growing up trees as a vine. When it's carpeting the ground is I think when it causes the most problems in my mind as an invasive because it's reducing the diversity of species that I'd like to see there. But if you can prevent it from growing up trees, you can stop it from producing seed and um, you know, reduce the amount of new winter creeper you've got popping up everywhere. Uh, so that's that's a benefit right there. And in some ways, some tips that I'd recommend for that is, as you mentioned, um, if you pull it down, it can break the, the bark. It really, it's, it's amazing. Uh, while I don't like it because it, it causes negative impacts, it's very ingenious the way it attaches to the trees and has these adventitious roots that'll kind of embed almost in the bark. Um, so you can't pull it down easily. What I recommend is to cut a chunk. If you've got a big vine and they can get quite large, cut a chunk of it out 
like like that big and just leave the stuff that's growing up in the tree that will die um, just cut cut a chunk of the vine out several inches so that it's not the stuff that's up in the tree will die mm -hmm. and then you can uh, paint the bottom of that cut stump with an herbicide um, that will just kill that winter creeper you just paint it on like a glyphosate or something just or tricopyr right on that trunk but nothing else and that will kill the root system of that winter creeper um, but not the tree that that it was growing on and that's important because sometimes if people are hacking you know trying to saw that winter creeper off it'll hurt the tree's bark which is definitely something you want to avoid one thing that i found to be helpful is you can take a pry bar and kind of gently pry um, it off of that bark just that little that little bit that you're going to cut off um, and not the other parts um, so that's that's one tip i would have and when it's smaller you can certainly pull it off the tree see uh, did you say the video would be on the urban forestry initiative you know it's going to be on the K ky forest health and i'll put a link okay. to that in just okay. a moment um, here i can I've been, stop yeah, and share to... and put that <laughs> link i think i have a few links that i owe you all um so let me find some of those uh did did you already put the um the trees are good and uh, extension office links there. I did the extension office links, but I'll, I'll do put trees, trees are, are good. good. Okay, great. Okay. Um, that's that's the the arborist group, and I totally recommend checking them out. There is a world of difference between a knowledgeable tree professional and someone with a chainsaw who came by and said they cut you know you know trim your tree for cheap. Um, they, they might know what they're talking about, but they might not. And, and with a tree with something as long lived as that, you don't really want to risk it because you can't undo damage that's been done to trees. Uh, trees don't heal, they seal. And so you can never undo that kind of uh, damage that's been done. So I think some good care is, is great. Um, here is yeah, the link to the YouTube page, for, uh, KY Forest Health, oh. and I'll put that right there. And I think one thing to think about with arborists too is, you know, some some um, trees mean more to us than others, mm -hmm. and yep. also some are more dangerous if they're near the home. And so it's something else you kind of have to consider, you know, especially if you're having somebody come on your property, you want to make sure they're going to do the right thing. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Any questions that we missed? All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. And if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out um, and happy tree week. Thank you all. Have a great week.